when David finds out that Saul and Jonathan have been killed, he rends his garments, he tears his clothes, as do the men around him. This was a standard show of being overwhelmed with grief. It happens throughout the Old Testament. Uh, you have many figures who not only do that, but cover themselves with uh, dust. Uh, they dress in sackcloth, shave their heads. These are shows of intense grief and mourning. And yet, as with the law and righteousness, because Paul is talking about that in Galatians, it's not the outward show that counts. And so we see, for instance, the prophet Joel says, rend your hearts and not your garments. In other words, it's like circumcision. We are supposed to be circumcised in our hearts. The mere circumcision of the flesh can become only a sign. And so rending of the garments is supposed to be a sign of great grief, and it's supposed to occur when something terrible has happened. In, for instance, uh, Jeremiah, there's uh, a time when the people around the king do not rend their garments at a moment when the king is tearing up the scroll of prophecy that Jeremiah has written, and they should be rending their garments, but they don't. It should be an appropriate show of great grief, but there's something in particular that you have to see here that I think is fascinating and that I don't know how often it's pointed out, but it's in the next little tab over, which is right here. In Leviticus, part of the law, the Mosaic law, which Paul talks so much about, one of the many laws in Leviticus, the priest who is chief among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, the ephod, the vestments, and so forth. This priest, the high priest of the Jews, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. The high priest is forbidden from rending his garments. And yet, what do we see? When Jesus responds, the high priest said to him here in verse 63, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the anointed one, the truly anointed one. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven referring both to Psalm 110 and to Daniel, the prophet. And what happens? The high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death. And they spit on him and hit him. This was an act itself of blasphemy. The great irony when the high priest tears his clothes in a show of great grief before the apparent blasphemy of Jesus Christ in referring to himself as the Messiah, that act alone is a violation of the Mosaic law and a kind of horror. So we talked about the ephod yesterday, well, we talked about it in the notes on my blog about the, the Urim and Thummim, which are part of the vestments of the, of the Jewish priest. And yet here we see the very garments torn and rended when they should not have been, when he was forbidden from doing that. There's irony upon irony that's written into these accounts of the passion. Of course, Paul gets difficult here in Galatians, and perhaps next time we'll talk about how James comes along and tries to correct some misunderstandings of Paul. And of course, one of the things we did last semester was we looked at the story of Abraham because you can't understand what Paul is saying in Galatians about Abraham and the law unless you know Abraham. 
you have to, in a sense, know the whole Bible before you can understand any part of it. And then once you understand the parts of it, you have to place them in context in the whole story. That's why it's so important to do what we're doing and to work our way through it bit by bit.